Joining me this seminar, we're very fortunate to have our visitor, Brandon Bozic, Bozic, who's visiting us from Maryland. He did his PhD work at UC Davis before moving to, to first Johns Hopkins, and now he's at the University of Maryland. Um, you're here for Dark Matter Week, it's like the Discovery Channel show, so we're continuing in this series. And we tell you today about Axion Dark Matter. So, Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm uh, now a postdoc at the University of Maryland. Um, and the Joint Space Science Institute. Um, I'm working with Mike Wellen Colchin and on things that are uh, quite different than this. Um, so uh, I'm meeting with some of you today, but if you have any interest in talking about actually what I'm doing now, I'd be excited to chat with you about it. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about uh, work to constrain uh, the parameter space of uh, ultralight axions, um, uh, which are uh, a candidate dark matter particle. Um, this work is done while I was at uh, Johns Hopkins my collaborators are David Marsh, who's an expert on uh, axions and dark matter, uh, Rosie Weiss, and Joe Silk. Um, uh, you can find more about uh, the paper here in full if you're uh, interested. Um, so here is a visual representation of the uh, history of the universe. Um, we have a very strong understanding, with maybe the exception of the first few moments, of the evolution of the universe in the first few hundred thousand years. So, uh, following the recombination um, of uh, electrons, free electrons into hydrogen and helium uh, uh, nuclei, uh, CMB photons free stream throughout the universe and we enter this period known as the Dark Ages. So it's during this period of the Dark Ages that uh, neutral gas is accreted on the dark matter halos, cools, fragments, and forms the first stars. These first stars in these first galaxies are likely the primary drivers of reionization. Um, as the, uh, and reion is the universe as it moves from a neutral medium to, a re, uh, to an ionized uh, state, um, finishing at about a redshift of six or so. Uh, thanks, to pioneering, uh, <coughs> thanks to pioneering observations by the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and a variety of CMB uh, observatories, uh, we've begun to have a window into uh, the reionization uh, epic. Um, future experiments like James Webb Space Telescope, advanced CMB telescopes, uh, uh, radio uh, telescopes will begin to, uh, like the SKA, will begin to tell us more about the dark ages of reionization. However, what we can do now, though, is leverage the relatively large amount of observations we have at low redshift uh, to get a better handle of what took place during the epic reionization. So uh, the focus of this talk will be uh, to do to explore the link between the low redshift and the high redshift universe in order to constrain a, a dark matter uh, particle model. So the um, standard cosmological model at this point describes the universe as being uh, primarily dominated by dark energy and cold dark matter. Structure formation in a cold dark matter model uh, <coughs> proceeds hierarchically, where small structures form early in the universe, and then merge uh, to form uh, larger objects, uh, like the Milky Way. Um, this is uh, illustrated nicely in this image from the VLAC-T2 simulation. The VLAC-T2 simulation is a very high resolution zoom simulation uh, designed to give a very uh, detailed account of the redshift zero Milky Way dark matter halo. Um, you should see in detail, <coughs> give a little zoom in here. Uh, the hierarchical formation, uh, low mass galaxy dark matter halos form first and merge. Most of them will be destroyed, but a large number of subhalos will survive to become uh, bound objects of the Milky Way. So within the virial radius of the VLAC-D2 uh, dark matter halo, there's over 40,000 subhalos within the virial radius. So because low mass galaxies are the sites of the first galaxies that form early in the universe and survive to become the hosts uh, of the low mass uh, dark matter are the hosts of the satellite galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way, I think small scales are a really great place to study the nature of dark matter and galaxy formation in general. So what we want to do then is to learn more about uh, cold dark matter by comparing with observations in the local universe. Um, and so when we do this, cold dark matter uh, has some issues. Um, uh, and this opens up many intriguing questions about galaxy formation. 
things that happens on small scales. So on the left is a plot from uh, Tolerud et al. So this is the luminosity function of the Milky Way satellites. In red, you have the currently <coughs> observed luminosity function of satellite galaxies. Uh, and so we've, we have about two dozen uh, known satellite galaxies in the Milky Way. Similar numbers for M31, uh, our nearest neighbor. Um, these, uh, most of these uh, galaxies, or about half of them have been found, were found by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has a limited uh, view of the sky. So if you were to correct to have a Sloan Digital Sky Survey that has a full view of the Milky Way uh, halo, as well as to <coughs> extend the sensitivity of Sloan such that an ultra-faint galaxy could be observed at the very uh, outskirts of the Milky Way, you would expect this blue curve here, this, uh, or you could extrapolate to get this blue curve here, and so you'd expect somewhere in the order of hundreds of satellite galaxies. This is vastly different still from the tens of thousands of subhalos that we see in these cold dark matter simulations. So this is what's known as the missing satellite problem. There's far more dark matter halos, uh, subhalos, uh, in simulation than satellite galaxies than we even expect to see with uh, a full sky observation. <coughs> so you're left with one of two options. You can either come up with a scenario of galaxy formation in cold dark matter such that the majority of these subhalos remain dark, or you can appeal to an alternative form of dark matter. So uh, the plot on the right shows um, a very simple uh, picture of uh, different uh, dark matter models and uh, the likely uh, the number of subhalos that you would uh, expect in these theories. So we're going to consider really just warm dark matter. Um, this curve is actually wrong. It should turn over and, and uh, look like this green curve here. I'm sure Mark probably told you something, something about that yesterday. Um, uh, warm dark matter uh, suppresses structure formation on low mass scales. It uh, decouples early in the universe while it's still relativistic. And so the uh, particles have a primordial velocity that allows them to free stream. So instead of collapsing on small scales like we see in cold dark matter, uh, the particles free stream and small scale structure doesn't collapse, at least early in the universe. Um, and so what you have is this uh, suppression of uh, low mass uh, dark matter halos that would possibly resolve the missing satellites problem and give you a better accounting of the satellite galaxies we see in the local universe. So if we look at um, not only the number of dark matter halos, but the inner structure of dark matter halos, uh, cold dark matter universally features a NFW uh, profile for the density profiles of the dark matter halos. Uh, NFW profiles have a steep central cusp. And when we look at, uh, when we infer the dark matter uh, profiles of satellite galaxies in the local universe, uh, they're uh, observed to have a flat inner density profile or a core. So this is what's known as the core cusp problem. Uh, CDM uh, dark matter halos uh, appear to be inconsistent with the um, density profiles inferred from satellite galaxies. Excuse me, that's true of the Milky Way. Does that include nucleated dwarfs in the Virgo cluster? The dark dwarf galaxies are the field cusps. <coughs> yeah, so, so this problem right here, there's, there's possible tension. So th this, there's possible examples. Uh, the, the observer picture of the core cusp problem is, is I think, uh, kind of uh, on loose footing. I, I think there it is a po it is possible that maybe not all dwarf galaxies feature a core. Maybe some have a cusp. Maybe there's a range of profiles. Um, the Things Galaxies, uh, uh, the Things Survey found many galaxies that have a flattened inner uh, region using H1 data, and uh, um, so maybe somewhere in between a cusp and a core. Um, I think there's uh, strong evidence in some cases in the Milky Way, but maybe in other galaxies. So maybe there there's a range of possibilities, and there's. Uh, an explanation for this. So, in, uh, in the dark, in the cold dark matter scenario, uh, to solve the core cusp problem, so if all dwarf galaxies should have a core uh, density profile, um, there's work by Governato uh, et al.'s group that uh, has used supernova blowout in the centers of galaxies to remove a large amount of matter from the center and rearrange the dark matter profile, so flatten the cusp uh, to a core. Um, the Supernova, uh, the number you need multiple supernova uh, explosions of a certain energy range to, in order to do this. So the very massive galaxies, the, uh, the the density profiles will be too steep in the center to actually do the removal. So you'll still have a cusp for low, large mass galaxies. You'll find a core in the intermediate range, and at low mass you won't have enough star formation to actually remove the cusp. 
So it's possible that maybe there's a mass scaling to this as well. So I think it's an open question, the core cusp problem now. However, it still motivates looking at alternative dark matter models, which is the reason I mentioned it here. It's also related to the massive failures problem, and this is a little bit more robust, uh, maybe, or likely. So this is uh, work done by Michael and Colton, uh, who I'm working with now at Maryland. So this is uh, um, circular velocity profiles from the Aquarius simulation of the most uh, massive subhalos uh, in this one uh, Milky Way size dark matter halo from the Aquarius simulation. So the curves are the circular velocity profiles of the dark matter subhalos, and the points are the circular velocities taken at the half-light radius for the Milky Way satellite galaxies. And what you'll notice is that, um, and these are the nine brightest satellites in the Milky Way. So you would naively expect the brightest satellite galaxies to live in the most massive halos. However, the density profiles of these massive halos are far too dense to host the Milky Way satellite galaxies. So you're left with one or two options. You either <coughs> need some sort of mechanism that keeps these very massive uh, failures dark, um, or there's uh, a disconnect between the dark matter density profiles uh, and the most massive subhalos in the Milky Way satellite galaxies. Um, I can't remember if the solution. So I mean, somebody heard about this, and I can't remember if there was a reason that it isn't just some of the, the dark matter halos get stripped the more time they spend in them. Yeah, so there's right. work. So uh, again, these are dark matter only simulations. So there's okay. this. So if simulating with baryons maybe uh, solves a lot of these issues. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in that. Uh, so there's work done by Dee Zolotov, uh, who looked at, um, uh, which is a, a part of this Govern Auto group, that um, um, they did <coughs> simulations. They, she took uh, dwarf galaxies that went through this process of blowout and rearrangement of the dark matter halos, and then uh, ran it through uh, a cold dark matter Milky Way halo and watched the tidal stripping process occur. Uh, and what they found is that uh, halos that have gone through this uh, adjustment from a cusp to a core process preferentially strip such that the profiles that you would actually observe today are actually lower, and that maybe this uh, tidal stripping actually uh, helps solve this problem. The problem is, is that uh, what needs to be done is a full baryonic uh, simulation of the Milky Way in order, uh, since most of the tidal stripping is going to occur as it passes through the disk. The disk is a really large, uh, uh, plays an important role in that process, and we don't have a very high resolution simulation of the Milky Way that we can actually do this very all the way. Very sensitive, but this is it, it's an important source in the stripping process that actually, uh, at least according to uh, a D. Zoltov's paper, yeah, okay. to, to solve this problem. Okay. So it is possible that you could resolve this with <coughs> some sort of combination of blowout and stripping. Um, but I think, again, open question. Right. Um, OK, so um, as I mentioned before, uh, low mass galaxies and the high, uh, uh, high redshift universe are incredibly important. Um, so this upper left plot is a plot from Bowens et al. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has done um, multiple band deep imaging of many fields uh, in the high redshift universe and gives us uh, one of the most fundamental data sets for understanding the role of galaxies in the uh, um, epoch of reionization, uh, their role in, in reionization. Um, so what you have here is the UV luminosity functions from redshift 4 to redshift 8. Uh, um, the points are the actual data points, and then the curves are Schechter fun function fits through the data. <coughs> what these UV luminosity functions tell you is the uh, number density of uh, star-forming galaxies at high redshift that are likely to drive uh, reionization. Uh, integrating uh, these UV luminosity functions, you can determine the um, UV luminosity density of the universe. And then um, uh, extrapolating, um, so the UV luminosity density at redshift 8 is plotted in the blue curve here, uh, down to some faint uh, limiting magnitude. You'll notice that the dashed line here is the limiting depth, depth where the uh, HST data ends. Um, and then what you can do is determine the uh, UV luminosity density that you would need to maintain reionization, which is the gray bar here. So assuming an escape fraction of 20%, which is pretty commonly assumed in all these reionization studies, and a conversion from uh, a U, uh, the measured UV magnitude to an ionizing luminosity, you can determine the UV luminosity density you need to maintain reionization. You'll notice that the observed UV luminosity functions um, 
fall, uh, give you a UV luminosity density far below what you need to reionize the universe. So what's done is you need to extrapolate these UV luminosity functions to fainter magnitudes uh, where we don't currently have observations. There needs to be a large population of low mass faint galaxies uh, that, we have yet, uh, that we have not yet observed. They need to play a very large role in the reionization of the universe if we're going to not only uh, to reionize the universe by a redshift of six. So these need to extend down to a redshift, uh, down to a limiting magnitude of minus 13 to minus 10. Uh, if we're going to uh, achieve that. Another way of putting that is to look at the CMB optical depth. Um, uh, this is done work done by Mike, uh, Michael Cullen and uh, Fasher Pierre in 2012. So what's done here is these three curves are three different Schechter function fits to the UV luminosity function. Um, uh, the gray band is the WMAP7 uh, CMB optical depth and uh, with one sigma error bars. Um, and uh, these are um, the values of the CMB optical depth you get from these models if you extrapolate the UV luminosity function down to uh, these magnitudes here. So in order to satisfy uh, constraints on reionization from the CMB, you need to at least have a uh, 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 limiting magnitude of minus 13. So high redshift uh, um, low mass galaxies uh, need to play an important role in reionization. Um, so this is possibly a tension with, uh, if star formation at high redshift is supposed to uh, be an important role in reionizing the universe, uh, but at low uh, redshift, low mass galaxies need their star formation to be suppressed in order to solve the missing satellites problem. There's possibly a tension between these two uh, um, pieces of evidence. Uh, so Michael and Colton in 2014 took a look at this. So what you have on the left is an abundance matching relation between the halo mass and the uh, UV magnitude um, of uh, uh, dark matter halos at a redshift of eight. So this band here is the band that you would need in order uh, to have a UV luminosity function that uh, reionizes the universe. And so if you were to extrapolate that down to minus 10, the, uh, um, uh, you would, uh, that, that corresponds to a halo mass of 10 to the eight at a redshift of eight. Of those 10 to the eight, uh, solar mass halos, uh, over 50 would survive to be bound objects in the Milky Way. <coughs> so um, 50 uh, low mass galaxies at redshift of 8 would end up being surviving bound remnants possibly to be observed in the Milky Way today. In the local group, that's 170. You could lower this number uh, and find a, a smaller number, but there should be, uh, the galaxies that are responsible for ionization should end up uh, within the uh, Milky Way. Um, or at least those within uh, nearby the, the Milky Way's galaxy forming region of high redshift. So, um, okay, so this uh, abundance matching relation was uh, um, uh, done uh, for uh, all the uh, all the Milky Way and M31 uh, dark matter halos in the Elvis simulation. So the Elvis simulation is a series of a high resolution zoom in simulations of the local group. Uh, so simulating a Milky Way and M31 partner. And um, these are the cumulative uh, mass functions um, at redshift zero uh, of uh, the bound satellites that survive um, from a redshift of eight uh, to today. So um, if that uh, the minimum virial mass of 10 to the eight um, gives you 20 to 70, uh, some sort of range of 20 to 70 uh, surviving remnants in the Milky Way today. So. Uh, and a larger fraction in the local volume. Um, what they also did is they, they took a very simple relation where they looked at the cosmic star formation rate density that you would need to reionize the universe um, uh, at a redshift of eight, maintain reionization at a redshift of eight, looked at the star formation rate, uh, they came up with a simple extrapolation of the star formation rate to halo mass, um, and then assumed a constant star formation rate from a redshift eight to redshift six, calculated the total number of stars that would form in those halos between a redshift of eight and redshift of six. So you would expect um, for uh, a dark matter halo at 10 to the eight uh, solar masses at redshift eight, over two times 10 to the five uh, um, solar masses in old stars. Um, and so you would expect anywhere, uh, so 20 to 70 of those uh, halos to be uh, satellites in the Milky Way today. Um, whereas we only observe, there's I think six to eight sub uh, satellites in the Milky Way that have that uh, amount of old stars. 
So there's a possible tension between this need to have a lot of star formation at high redshift and then suppress that at low redshift. Um, so there's a, a similar uh, uh, a related issue with warm dark matter. Uh, warm dark matter is going to suppress small scale structure, but you can't overdo that. Uh, if you have too much suppression of warm uh, of uh, uh, a small small scale structure, you can actually underpredict the number of satellites you'd expect in the Milky Way. So uh, on the left is work done by uh, Rachel Kennedy in 2014. Um, so the points are the uh, Milky Way satellite uh, luminosity function. Uh, again, this is corrected for a full sky uh, SDSS-like survey. And then the curves are uh, um, three different Milky Way, uh, the, uh, three different Milky Way masses. These are the satellite luminosity functions for, those, uh, for a Milky Way uh, mass of 2.5 times 10 to the 12 down to 8 times 10 to the 11. So within the observational range of what we expect the mass of the Milky Way to be. Um, and then she looked at three different uh, warm dark matter uh, particle models. So uh, there's a um, give and take between the amount of suppression you can have while also trying to reproduce uh, the Milky Way satellite uh, uh, luminosity function. Um, another way to look at this is uh, um, at high redshift. So this is work done by Christian Schultz et al. So they did. Uh, a series of high resolution uh, warm dark matter simulations for uh, several different warm dark matter particle masses. Um, uh, and uh, so these are the uh, cumulative mass functions for these different warm dark matter simulations at a redshift 6, redshift 7, and redshift 8. Um, and then the point here so this is the cumulative number of galaxies observed by the Hubble Space Telescope at these redshifts, summed down to the faint end limit. So um, these models need, are, need to predict more uh, dark matter halos than the number of uh, galaxies the uh, Hubble Space Telescope has already observed. So at redshift 6 and 7, uh, these models predict enough dark matter halos to account for uh, the Hubble Space Telescope's observations. But at redshift 8, it's just reaching there, such that if Hubble was to push to fainter magnitudes and see more galaxies at redshift 8, as you would naively expect in cold dark matter, this point would uh, rise up, you'd count more galaxies, and you could possibly rule out uh, 0.8 kV warm dark matter. Um, this point, uh, I should mention, this, was, this point is uh, placed on a halo mass function by, uh, through the abundance matching technique, so relating a halo mass to luminosity, and uh, the faint end limit is then placed on the uh, halo mass function. Uh, here. So the exact location <coughs> horizontally doesn't matter, it's just the vertical position uh, that's important. Sorry, can you, yeah. can you do some of this now for just clustering measurements of these high redshift galaxies? That would give you an estimate of uh, potentially a halo mass. Or is that basically folded into this abundance matching thing already? Or is it really, so I guess the question is, is the abundance matching between the mass function of halos and luminosity function? Yeah, it's, it's, it's that simple. It's just a one-to-one -one relation right. between the cumulative. So does the model to make different predictions for what the clustering should look like? I don't think there's any mass information in the function. In what? There's no mass information in the function. Right, it's just, it's just, it's just rank order and start population. populating yes. things yeah. together. Yeah. But then so if you looked at, would these models make different predictions of the clustering properties of redshift 6, 7, and 8 galaxies? Go measure now. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure you can. Um, the question is, is um, uh, so I mean, all warm dark models, uh, warm dark matter models will reproduce the large scale structure of cold dark matter okay, um, right. to, to to some extent, right? So you'd have to push to uh, some uh, clustering scale where you could actually probe the lower end of this. And so right. I'm not sure whether you could actually accomplish that or not. Mm -hmm. sure. So, but it's true that the, the your figure on the right there is from the abundance matching. Yes, that's right. So that was a. <coughs> yeah, these are very different techniques that are being done. Yeah, yeah. I should mention this is uh, work that's been done through uh, using semi-analytic modeling using the Galform model. So it's merger trees, and uh, there's a definite a galaxy formation prescription that's folded into this. Um, okay, so that brings us to uh, uh, axiom mixed dark matter. Uh, a model that we're going to consider for the rest of this talk. Um, uh, okay, so what we're going to consider is looking at a multi-component uh, dark matter model. So we're going to look to uh, the dark matter is going to compose of some fraction of cold dark matter in the form of WIMPs uh, and ultralight axions. Um, 
ultralight axions are interesting because <coughs> uh, uh, they'll have a sound dependent, uh, a scale dependent sound speed. So for at very very large scales, uh, they'll behave just like cold dark matter, and at uh, small scales, the sound speed will be large and structure formation is it will be suppressed. So uh, the axion over density will evolve according to the uh, usual equation, <coughs> and um, you can solve to find uh, the gene scale mass below which structure formation will be suppressed. Uh, so what we did in our work is we used the extended projector method to calculate halo mass functions uh, at a variety of redshifts um, uh, to try and constrain the, uh, an axion model with a combination of cold and... So yeah. you're doing the axion for a um, so, uh, so how light is ultra light with mass? So yeah, so I'll get that. So it's 10 to the minus 23 to 10 to the minus 21. Uh, EV. EV. Oh, yeah, right. It's incredibly light. Yeah. Um, okay, so here are uh, the uh, mass functions that we look at. So the goal is to constrain the parameters of the axion uh, uh, model. So we're going to try and constrain the axion mass and then the fraction of uh, axions uh, to the total amount of dark matter. Um, so the axiom mass we're going to consider, as I said, 10 to the minus 23 EV to 10 to the minus 21 EV. Um, if you were to do a simple comparison uh, to try and find uh, the warm dark matter particle mass that compares to this, so this is roughly a uh, 250 EV thermal warm dark matter particle and a 2K, uh, 2K EV uh, warm dark matter particle. Something like that. So are you saying that? Are you saying it was equilibrium or no? So, um, so what, to, to get that to get the comparison, what we're doing is just doing the transfer function. So we're looking at the where the, the comparison is at uh, suppressing fifty percent in each case, and so the warm dark matter particle mass that would give you that suppression versus. Uh, <coughs> so it's just uh, that simple relation. Okay. Um, and we're going to consider. Uh, uh, two cases where the axions can contribute 50% of the dark matter or are 100% of the dark matter. Um, okay, so uh, what we have, uh, so on the right, we have the halo mass functions. Uh, uh, the dashed lines are for uh, cold dark matter, and then the solid lines are the halo mass functions for 10 to the minus 22 EV uh, uh, axion particle, where, uh, where it's 100% of the total uh, fraction of the uh, total amount of dark matter. So this, uh, these are the halo mass functions from a redshift of 14 to a redshift of 0. And what you can see is that there's a strong suppression, a strong truncation in the uh, low mass uh, 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 formation of halos at all redshifts. Um, if we then relax the amount of axions, uh, uh, axion fraction of dark matter to 50%, um, we, there's a suppression of uh, in the halo mass function but not a complete truncation. So there will be some amount, it's a little hard to see on this, this obviously curves and flattens here to uh, complete this picture. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there'll be a suppression, but there will be some small number of low mass halos that'll form uh, even at very high redshift. Um, okay, so uh, we want to compare to observations. So in order to do that, we need to turn our mass functions into some sort of observable. And uh, to do that, we're going to use the abundance matching technique. So what we do is uh, we use the Bowens et al. 20, uh, 2014 uh, UV luminosity functions. We fit the data to uh, a Schechter function uh, given here, um, which is basically fitting these three parameters. Um, we take these uh, UV luminosity functions and we integrate to get a cumulative luminosity function. And the abundance matching technique relates the cumulative uh, uh, halo mass function to the cumulative luminosity function in order to say, uh, uh, to relate a halo mass to a UV luminosity. So basically what this says is that a dark matter halo of this mass has a galaxy of this brightness inside of it. Um, so we'll use, uh, we'll develop this, uh, once we have this halo mass uh, magnitude relation, we'll then use that to predict a cumulative luminosity function. So this process is a little bit circular, um, unless you have uh, the halo mass functions that we have, where you have the strong suppression on uh, small scales. Um, okay, so here are the halo mass functions again, and here is the abundance matching uh, 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 relation uh, that we get. <clears throat> so the black curves here are the uh, cold, the 
um, halo mass uh, uh, magnitude relation from pullback matter for redshift 7, redshift 10, and redshift 13. Um, and pink is 10 to the minus 21, where the action infraction is um, uh, uh, 1. And then uh, for 10 to the minus 22, 100% of the dark matter is in the form of axions. And then, uh, I'm sorry, 50% uh, uh, is uh, axions. And then in blue is 10 to the minus 22 with 100%. 10 to the minus 23 is up here. Um, so uh, what you should, what the thing to notice is that for a case with 100%, with this strong trunk, uh, turnover in the mass function, we have a truncation in the uh, abundance matching relation. Um, <coughs> however, even in, so in the case of a turnover, uh, where we have the strong suppression in the mass function, leads to a strong turnover in the halo mass luminosity relation such that a large fraction of dark matter halos are mapped to uh, essentially a singular value in uh, luminosity. So uh, we're going to consider several different models. Um, uh, we're going to look at two different checker function fits. Um, for the purpose of the talk, it's not so important, but we're, again, considering 100% uh, axion fraction and then 50%. So I guess the turnover is pretty true. It does result in factors through matching in cumulative number density. So when you get to those lower mass halos, they're just getting to pile up or not pile up stronger. You're, you're adding less and less of them. So the workout is going to be giving you the has to go in any range of halos. Yeah, okay. exactly. So I mean, if you, when you consider <coughs> those mass functions, this cumulative uh, uh, yeah, mass right. function ends up flattening. So right. exactly that, you're, you're ending up just packing more and more on. Yeah, you said better. All right, so here are our first results. So here are the predicted uh, cumulative luminosity functions for an axion mixed dark matter model. Um, so we, uh, so from redshift six to redshift 10. Um, okay, so um, in black are the cumulative uh, luminosity functions for cold dark matter for the two different checker function fits. They're uh, pretty much the same in all plots except at the bright end of very high redshift. So uh, um, I won't discuss them any further. Um, uh, in green, we have uh, is the cumulative luminosity functions for 10 to the minus 23 eV, uh, where the axions are 50% of the dark matter. Um, and uh, blue is 10 to the minus 22. Uh, the thicker points are 100% uh, um, axion fraction of dark matter, and then the thinner points are 50%, which makes sense. You have more small halos, so um, you have thicker galaxies. 10 to the minus 21 EV isn't plotted at all because it just completely goes off the spot and it's completely consistent with cold dark matter. Uh, the point here is the uh, uh, cumulative number of galaxies observed by Hubble at these redshifts summed down to the faint end limit, which is why it gets placed at that point here. So this is the total number of galaxies observed down to this magnitude at these redshifts. Um, so what's immediately evident is that 10 to the minus 23 EV, even when 50% of um, the dark matter is in cold dark matter and 50% is in axions, predict fewer galaxies at redshift 6 than we've already observed. This point here falls below this point here. So um, it's already completely inconsistent with our current observations at high redshift. Um, and that obviously uh, continues to higher redshift. Um, 10 to the minus 22 EV is consistent at redshift 6 and 7. At redshift 8, a 100% uh, fraction of axion dark matter is just consistent um, with the Hubble uh, data and also at uh, redshift 10. So if Hubble was to push to slightly fainter magnitudes and find more galaxies, so if this point was to move up, we could uh, put the 10 to the minus 22 uh, EV model where with 100% axion fraction of dark matter uh, in tension or possibly rule it out. <coughs> uh, the dashed Vertical line here is an estimate for the James Webb Space Telescope's uh, 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 sensitivity uh, at these redshifts. So uh, James, the James Webb Space Telescope could possibly constrain uh, or differentiate between cold dark matter and a axion model of 10 to the minus 22 eV. Uh, this is important. Um, 10 to the minus 22 eV is roughly uh, in, in a thermal uh, equivalent of about 0.8 keV. So this is roughly the mass range where the axions would be expected to solve the core cusp issue. So James Webb could possibly rule out axions as a possible solution to the core cusp problem um, uh, if it reaches this sensitivity. Um, 
we've also looked at uh, Redshift 13. So by Redshift 13, James Webb should be able to distinguish between 10 to the minus 22 and cold dark matter. Um, plotted in pink um, is 10 to the minus 21 EV um, uh, for uh, axiom fraction uh, of dark matter of 100%. Um, so even uh, by uh, even with observations at Redshift 13 by James Webb Space Telescope, you won't be able to differentiate between 10 to the minus 21 and cold dark matter. Um, okay, so with uh, these UV luminosity functions, we can then go and look at uh, the reionization history um, of the universe. So uh, we have the simple model of the uh, reionization history, where Q is the volume filling fraction of ionized hydrogen. Um, um, and we have, uh, which is given by this source term, um, this is the uh, production rate of ionizing photons, which is balanced by a recombination term uh, on the right. Um, so most of our modeling goes into uh, this term here, uh, which is given by this equation. So if you uh, integrating the uh, uh, UV luminosity functions with this uh, conversion term, converting UV luminosity uh, to an ionizing photon luminosity, um, we can determine the production rate of ionizing photons and determine the uh, <coughs> uh, reionization history of the universe. So uh, the, our two model parameters are going to be the escape fraction and the uh, limiting magnitude, which we uh, extrapolate the uh, UV luminosity function down to. So we're going to consider uh, four different models um, uh, where we have uh, so two escape fractions of uh, 0.2, which is the 20% uh, escape fraction is pretty normal uh, for cold dark matter studies at, at these redshifts. And uh, we're going to consider a more extreme <coughs> model where 50% of the ionizing photons escape to uh, uh, contribute to ionization. Um, the limiting magnitudes. Uh, consider uh, two cases, minus 13 and minus 10, uh, giving us four models. Um, so once we have the um, realization history, we can plug that into uh, this equation here and solve for the um, CMB optical depth. So, um, so here are the realization histories. So on the left, the curves are the um, cold dark matter reionization histories that you get for those range of model parameters. So uh, on the uh, on the very right, um, we have a, uh, this is for the case of an escape fraction of 50% uh, and a limiting magnitude of minus 10. You notice that this completes reionization very early in cold dark matter. So this is probably a very unphysical model. Uh, I've kept it on the plot uh, so that we can compare to the more extreme cases in the axion uh, uh, results. Um, so. Uh, so for the cold dark matter cases can uh, can be ignored They're just for the purposes of comparison. Um, uh, so uh, the green uh, 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 the green patch here gives the reionization histories for uh, an axiom mixed dark matter model uh, uh, for a mass of 10 to the minus 23 eV. And what you'll notice is that regardless of the reionization assumptions from the more conservative at the left edge to the more extreme at the right edge. Uh, 10 to the minus 23 is unable to complete reionization by a redshift of 6, um, which we expect based on um, um, the gunn peterson trophin quasar spectra. So this model is uh, unlikely, um, uh, again, to uh, be uh, an accurate description of the dark matter. So on the right, we have the reionization histories <laughs> for uh, uh, axions uh, for the 10 to the minus 22 EV and the 10 to the minus 21 EV case. 10 to the minus 22 EV is given in blue, and 10 to the minus 21 is given in, in purple here. So this gives the full range of uh, possible reionization histories uh, from the left edge, which is our more consistent <coughs> case of 20% uh, escape fraction and an axion uh, fraction of uh, 100% um, to uh, the more extreme models of 50% axion fraction and 50% escape fraction. So we notice the right edge here corresponds to uh, this pink curve and, and cool dark matter. So uh, what's uh, a strong predictor for um, uh, axions as um, a dark matter particle is the reionization histories are going to be much uh, um, uh, uh, briefer and more truncated compared to the possible uh, cool dark matter cases. The left edge, uh, the more cons uh, conservative case uh, for reionization parameterization is pretty similar to cool dark matter. So I'll come back to this later. That's going to be important. Can I ask another question? I lost the physics here. Why is the mass function not a parameter of this? Uh, it is. Because it is. We, have, we really don't know what the mass function is. So it's a free <coughs> And didn't, I didn't, don't see any 
any alpha or anything in this in these equations which says what the mass function is. So they're the mass function. Yeah. The mass function of halos. No, no, the the for the ionizing radiation, I have to know what the mass function of the stars are. Because you are comparing star formation with uh, ionizing radiation, that's the mass function. Yes. And so I don't see where that was included in these models. It's sorry, that was I I uh, I I I was sorry, sorry, you still were messing about it. Yeah, 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 sorry, I was thanks. Yeah, I was um, so it's folded into this parameter here, which converts the UV luminosity function to an ionizing uh, photon luminosity. So um, this is, uh, um, uh, we, we follow the coolant voucher Gear uh, paper, which basically uh, uh, assumes uh, a, an SED model for uh, star formation and high redshift to, to, to make that conversion. Like slope with the high mass end of the sun cutoff? Yeah, and, and, and then uh, um, so uh, spectral energy density distribution. Uh, that gives, that gives uh, uh, something that fits simulations and what's done before. Um, so we, that's where it's folded in here. Yeah. So that would change. It isn't. It isn't something we we looked into. We just. Yeah. No, I, I just didn't understand where where we're in yeah. the equation. Sense. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. So. Um, uh, Okay, so with the reionization histories, we can uh, predict the CMB optical depth. So uh, again, on the left, the curves are for uh, the cold dark matter case. Um, so you can see that the most extreme model way over predicts uh, tau, and so um, completely unphysical. Um, 10 to the minus 23 EV is um, incapable, regardless of uh, how strong we make the reionization, of reproducing um, the uh, observed value of the CMB optical depth from Planck. Uh, this is the one and two sigma error bars from Planck. Um, and this is excluded to greater than three sigma. Um, on the right are the uh, um, uh, CMB optical, the predicted CMB optical depths for 10 to the minus 21 in purple and 10 to the minus 22 EV in blue. Uh, so in purple, um, uh, this uh, the topmost curve here corresponds to the rightmost edge. So this is the most extreme randomization case of an escape fraction of 50% and a fraction of 50% uh, uh, of dark matter. Um, uh, and uh, this is the center curve is a model that just shows that we can uh, fit the, uh, hit the uh, point expected value dead on. And then the uh, bottommost curve here gives you the leftmost edge of the organization history. So this is for an escape, uh, the more realistic escape fraction of 20% and uh, an axion fraction um, dark matter of 100%. So um, the 10 to the minus 21 EV is completely consistent uh, to within two sigma of uh, uh, plane constraints on uh, the CMB optical depth. So there's uh, we can't constrain, we can't differentiate between cold dark matter and CMB uh, in the case of the 10 to the minus 21. Uh, <coughs> 10 to the minus 22, on the other hand, um, has uh, 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 only the most extreme cases are consistent with the Planck results uh, to two sigma. Um, so you need an escape fraction, of, uh, so this topmost curve has an escape fraction of 50%. Um, same with this curve here. Uh, the darker blue curve on the, on the top here has an escape fraction of 20%, but it, half of the dark matter has to be uh, in the form of cold dark matter. So you either need, and both of these are, 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 um, are consistent at the three sigma level. So uh, these, are, uh, these two models are in, already in tension at the three sigma level. Um, uh, so you you need at least half the dark matter to be uh, in the form of uh, half the dark matter to be cold and a large escape fraction for uh, the 10 to the minus 22 EV case to be consistent with Planck to two sigma. Uh, everything else is ruled out to uh, uh, larger significance. Um, or, so this model is in tension with the CMB results. Okay, so my last slide on this topic. Um, is uh, future constraints from uh, next generation CMB telescopes. Um, so um, uh, th there's a proposed experiment called the Vance ACPOL, um, and th the Vance ACPOL telescope is uh, an update to the ACPOL uh, telescope that's observing right now. Um, Advanced ACPOL could possibly constrain the epoch of reionization using the kinetic uh, SZ effect um, by um, what it would measure was the uh, duration and the um, time that reionization uh, occurs. So it'll measure, it can tell you uh, when uh, reionization is halfway done, and then give you the, uh, the uh, duration between 25% and 75%. Uh, 
So um, there, it could constrain the redshift range, uh, the duration of reionization, to 0.2. Um, and so uh, these are uh, several different reionization histories from um, uh, for 10 to the minus 21 and cold dark matter. And uh, what I've done is I've drawn lines to guide the eye to 75% uh, of the universe is reionized, uh, to 25% of the universe is reionized. So in, um, <coughs> in so the solid curve is cold dark matter, and the dashed curve, uh, it's hard to see here, is an axion dark matter model. Um, so this the difference in the duration for the axions uh, and the cold dark matter um, is significant, is, uh, while small, is significant enough by uh, the advanced act pole uh, uh, <laughs> measure to distinguish between these two models. Um, so the cases where uh, more extreme reionization histories, it would, it's possible to distinguish between cold dark matter and uh, a 10 to the minus 21 EV axion. Uh, more conservative reionization histories uh, won't be, uh, you, can't, you can't distinguish with, this, uh, with, this, with these measurements. So it's possible that some fraction of parameter space could be constrained um, by next generation uh, to, uh, CMB telescopes. So just to conclude, uh, 10 to the minus 23 EV is completely ruled out by Hubble data. Um, it can't by expectations for reionization and the CMB optical depth. 10 to the minus 22 EV um, is uh, in tension with CMB results at the three sigma range. And uh, the James Webb Space Telescope <coughs> could possibly have more say on this and maybe rule this model out. Uh, 10 to the minus 21 EV is uh, completely consistent uh, with uh, cold dark matter with everything that we've uh, looked at, and but it's possibly some range of parameter space to be ruled out uh, in the future experiments. So I think we'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I want to say one thing. I just want to advertise this. So this was a paper that came on uh, of the archive earlier this week. So this is work I did with uh, um, Wayne uh, Nung, um, who's a grad student of uh, Ray Carlberg's at the University of Toronto. Um, so uh, what he did was uh, he used, um, so what we've done is we've modeled uh, to very high accuracy the um, gravitational potential of uh, the Via Lactea II's uh, Milky Way dark matter halo. And we've done this both with subhalos and without subhalos. We've removed the subhalos, modeled the gravitational potential, and then um, put the subhalos back in and, and, and modeled the potential with those. So the goal here is to use tidal stream. So we've placed a small tidal stream uh, in uh, that potential, uh, watched it orbit around, um, and looked at the disruption that you would find in the tidal stream from the, uh, the subhalos versus uh, uh, a case without subhalos. Um, and it's possible that um, subhalo interactions with the stream are, will produce a pattern of gap-like features that will allow us to uh, do an accounting for the number of dark matter uh, uh, subhalos. Uh, that are in the Via Lactea. So if there is a large population of dark subhalos, um, it's possible that uh, their interactions with uh, stellar streams will be able to uh, um, allow us to account for them. So I'll just advertise that and find a way to take questions. Other questions? Yeah, other questions. So, uh, the standard axion story is that um, sort of about a KDB or so, their thermal, and if you sort of decrease the mass down to a few KDB or so, that's like hot dark matter, basically. But then, um, then, then you make this transition below about a DB or so, and sort of the more you crank down the mass, you have this non-thermal production regime, which I think is the regime you're in. Yeah. And you crank down the mass, <coughs> like the colder they get, because they produce proposed abundance. So basically, so, so this is so what you're talking about. I guess this might be a part of the question. That's I don't know if anybody really worked actually thought about this, but like if the standard story is that actually uh, you know the dark matter is getting colder as you as it gets you know down to ten to minus ten EV and below, you're actually in a different regime here. You're, you're it's flipping over again somehow. So what happens is at ten to the minus twenty. So the physical way to actually think about the gene scale is is that uh, the the particle is actually so light that the uh, de Broglie uh, de Broglie wavelength is uh, large on astrophysical scales. So what you're actually seeing is is the um, uh, uh, the uncertainty principle preventing localization of low mass structure. So, so, that, so basically, so, so the physics here basically, as far as you're seeing, the <coughs> physics is you just put this sound speed term in. Uh, in right. So the assuming uh, so that's using the. Yeah, it's, fluid, it's like fluid like approximation. Yeah, it's so a fluid like exactly. So it's a gas of, os of axions oscillating at the bottom of the potential and, and 
<laughs> and then using it's a scalar field, and so doing the fluid approximation, you get that sound speed. Okay, so you're so so that sense, this doesn't care about you know you don't care about how it's produced or no. No, no, so uh, these axions would, uh, are all beyond standard model that are, yeah. if I think uh, Dottie, uh, David Marsh, who's an expert in this, is, considers most of these the string, the string models that produce this range of axion masses, this axiverse. So does these particles go into the census of the number of particles that are often WF which is uh, No. Why not? Um, because. Because. So they're not thermally cold, I don't understand. Yes, uh, so, uh, so I'm not the expert on, on, on the axions um, uh, and exactly the production mechanisms that are considered, but my understanding is that they, they, yeah, they should be. Okay. Okay, so. In effect, that's the next point. So he's, he's saying that I, what I said was just wrong. So. <laughs> They would determine the number yeah, of yeah, because the sound is more they consider the constraint from the Okay. Okay, yeah, so I actually I don't know. I didn't think so, but I guess I was on the correct that. One other question really different on this thing. Does it also punch holes in gas or you calculate this? I don't know. That's a good question. Um because gas be was very clear in the whole galaxies, and so if you had any amount of punching in holes and gas streams, you shouldn't be looking at our the halo of our galaxy. You Streams in the external galaxies, which are mostly gas, but they're also stars. Yeah, so I guess, um, so, so I don't, so this is, <coughs> yeah, I, 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 would, I would imagine, um, I, I, so, so I don't know. So I, I would I, I, yes, I would imagine that you could do that, and uh, that, that would be something I consider. Um, uh, but for now, um, this is all state of the art at this point. Just looking at just uh, we're basically just using a bunch of particles because the polar rings don't recess if they're either per particle pull on the triaxial system, so they last for a long time. Yeah. Whereas we see streams that are in an angle, they will recess pretty quickly in the direction of the, of the, the major axis. So there are these streams that we studied 20 or 15 years ago by Paul Schechter. Uh, how many times you can see wrapped around polar streams in certain galaxies? Yeah. So they're very longer things. Okay. Um, that's something we'll think about. So, warm dark matter should delay structure formation, right? Yes. So, are there any predictions for, say, clustering lens at H7 or something in Syrian versus? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, so my collaborator, David Marsh, is actually really interested in, um, uh, in actually looking at lensing in order to constrain these models. Uh, I think it's a, uh, um, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's, that's uh, stuff that people are working on now. I, I don't know of any new constraints, um, but it's definitely something that's of interest to them. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you so much.